Good morning from the Oklahoma's Video Studio. I'm Dave Morris. Time to look back at some of the stories that made headlines this week, some of the stories that we're working on that will be in the upcoming headlines, and some weekend coverage for you as well in the Oklahoma and online at newsok.com. Here to help us with this conversation today, Ben Felder, Don McCoy, and Mike Sherman. Gentlemen, good morning. Thanks for joining good morning. us. Thanks. Good morning, Dave. Education, business, sports, Thunder takes on Dallas on Sunday, uh, sorry, Saturday, right down the street at Jackie at Chesapeake Energy Arena. I was saying today's April 15th, it's tax day, it's Jackie Robinson Day, and as Don McCoy points out, the day that Titanic sank. That's right, yeah. long time ago. Don tweets out a, a headline or a front page uh, every day. What got you started on that, by the way? I don't know, I just, we have a, we have a great uh, resource where you can look at all the newspapers that we've ever printed. And, and I just got fascinated by going back and looking at these front pages, and probably initially it was to find my stories. And then I, I thought, well, this would be a great thing to tweet out to people. So every day I, I've got them scheduled all the way to June. So I'm learning more about history. Back in 1912, the Titanic 1912, sank, as, right. we, as we just looked up. They made a movie about that. <laughs> Uh, ben, lots going on, on the education front. A lot of educators going out to the Capitol this week for filing day. We're seeing educators uh, wanting to get involved in the legislative process there. A couple of meetings last night. You attended the KIPP meeting. Uh, so let's start right there. What was that and how'd that go? Yeah, well, there's been some uh, charter school expansion proposals that have kind of been uh, brought to the school district's attention. There's actually three different charter schools that are looking to expand in some way or another. Um, and right now, the conversation is focusing on KIPP. It's a charter in uh, East Oklahoma City right now, middle school only. Um, a highly rated, uh, according to state rankings, um, and a demographic that is uh, predominantly African-American, high poverty, it kind of mirrors the community that, that it's in. Uh, the principal, Tracy McDaniel of KIPP, is looking to expand his operation to include elementary and high school. KIPP currently right now shares space with uh, Moon Elementary. Uh, they're looking to uh, find another elementary school that they might be able to share space with. Um, it hasn't been officially named, but uh, Martin Luther King Elementary is the only school in that area that will be able to hold what they're looking to do. And so a series of community meetings have been held. This was the second of three last last night um, on, in East Oklahoma City to kind of present this proposal to the public. A couple hundred people there, yeah. judging from what I saw you uh, post on Twitter last night. What was the reaction from the people? What were some of their questions? Yeah, it's it's been it's been kind of mixed. Uh, people are pretty passionate on both sides of the issue. I think um, you know uh, charters. Everybody has kind of a theory on what that looks like, and and, and you know no charter is really the same. Um, you know, people have, because the, I said there were three charters that were looking to expand, it, there's been some confusion on how, how the other two are connected to this. Um, you know, really at these public meetings, uh, uh, Mr. McDaniel, the principal, has really just tried to kind of outline some facts, which he said are that th he wants to put a school that has attendance boundaries, meaning that if you live within the attendance boundaries, just like you do now for your neighborhood school, you get to go. So they don't want to exclude kids that live in this neighborhood. Um, and he also is telling the community, look, we've, ha we've struggled with academic performance, especially in our part of Oklahoma City, for, for generations. And uh, he believes that he has a model that is working. His statistics seem to kind of bear that out. Uh, a lot of the students that go on uh, after KIPP uh, do very well in high school and in college. Um, and he says he wants to expand that and work with other schools to, to share best practices. But there's still some apprehension um, in the community, uh, just still some unknowns with that. They're a little bit concerned that there's still that divide of haves and haves not, and I guess Tracy was trying to address that, right? Yeah, I, like I said, I think some people have seen in charters because, um, you know, let's say that a family is able to get selected to another charter, well, they don't have the same transportation requirements, so a parent has to, has to get a student to that school. And, and so sometimes there's been some accusations that charters kind of, um, you know, for lack of a better term, cherry pick. Uh, like I said, all charters are different and they have different scenarios, but uh, like I said, Mr. McDaniel has, has tried to say, listen, we are a charter school in East Oklahoma City for East Oklahoma City and, and the kids that I'm wanting to work with are the ones that are struggling the most. In fact, he, he shares data that says that the kids that are coming in when it comes to reading and math scores are performing lower than the district average. When they leave, they're performing higher. He's looking at those numbers on the way out saying, hey, here's a success that we're seeing in our model. Perhaps we can expand that. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's what he'd like to do. And no official, present or no f official proposal has been brought to the board. The school board has voted to, uh, quote, quote, unquote, continue the conversation. But uh, he would like to launch this school in the uh, 2017 school year. Uh, it says he's been talking with the district for a few years, but, see, uh, but feels optimi optimistic that this is the time to, to make that expansion a reality. About 9 o'clock last night, I walked over to or drove over to the uh School board meeting, Oklahoma City Public Schools at 9th and North Klein. Uh, media sitting around. It was an empty room at that point. That was three hours into executive session, Ben, last night. They eventually went five hours. 
addressing the status of current Oklahoma City Public Schools Superintendent Rob New. What did we learn last night? Well, what we learned last night after that five-hour executive session was not much, but that Rob New is no longer uh, in office, was the quote, at superintendent. He hadn't been suspended. He hadn't been fired. He hadn't turned in a letter of resignation. Uh, he just was no longer performing the duties of superintendent. Aurora Laura, the district's associate superintendent, uh, is now the acting superintendent, and, and so she is kind of performing those duties. But we don't know um, uh, what the what the future will hold. A five-hour meeting. I mean, obviously the board, the details of what the board discussed uh, were not disclosed. Uh, but uh, it's been reported. Uh, Tim Willard, who was at the meeting, uh, Oklahoman's education reporter, first reported on Monday that New had told some board members during a conference over the weekend in Boston that he had intentions to resign. A couple days later, New uh, put out a statement saying that he had not resigned, but did not deny the reports. And uh, uh, at Thursday, the, the board met to discuss his employment, and that's where we stand right now. So what are the, some of the angles? I know you're working on this as well as Tim Willer. What are some of the angles we're following here? Our, our assumption is uh, he's still being paid at this point. He has a salary of over 240000 Yeah. Uh, like I said, I don't think anything is, has changed <coughs> with his contract. Um, what what some of the questions that we have and some of the confusion in this is as, as like Tim reported uh, some of the board members were told or, or apparently were told by uh, superintendent knew that he had an intention to resign um, uh, Tim reported that on Monday. Uh, there was a lot of media attention around that. Uh, two days later is when New came out and said, I haven't resigned, but did not deny the report. So uh, we're not really sure what the motivation for the school board is. I mean, they've butted some heads on some issues uh, recently. Uh, Ruth Veals has had some sharp criticism for Superintendent New. Uh, she's the school board member that represents East Oklahoma City, and her criticism is, uh, has centered on uh, KIPP's charter expansion and, and whether or not the superintendent has been uh, open to this idea. Um, but what's really surprising and kind of a tough time for the school district as it is for many across the state. Uh, it was just uh, about a month ago the district announced they were going to have to lay off over 200 teachers next year for projected budget cuts. Almost another 100 administrators and cuts to other programs are coming down the pike too. Teacher shortage, discipline issues, there's a lot to consider. Yeah, it's a tough time. Uh, you know, a story that I'm looking at right now is kind of uh, taking a look at the tenure of urban superintendents, not just in Oklahoma City, but across the country, uh, that those tenures aren't long. Uh, when you look back, I believe we've had about 11 superintendents in Oklahoma City over the past 15 years, and that includes a few interims wow. in there as well. It, it, this is not a job that somebody stays in for a long time. That's not unique to Oklahoma City. A lot of large school systems and big cities across the country have some similar situations. You know, in talking with some people at organizations that work with urban school systems, I mean, they'll admit it's a tough job. I mean, you're coming in, you're dealing with issues of high poverty, uh, discipline issues. Um, you know, I kind of liken it to, uh, you know, a football team that's been losing for, for a long time. You come in, it's not an easy ship to turn around, but there's a lot of expectations even after that first season. I was talking with Mark Myers last night. He's now a PIO for uh, the public school system, and he was joking that back in his days when he worked at KTOK, some of those meetings stretched till 2 or 3 in the morning, so perhaps 11 o'clock was letting him off the hook last yeah, night. Yeah, maybe so. I know, I know Tim was burning to get that story in and did a good job. Uh, obviously, we have our deadlines, but uh, uh, yeah, still a lot of questions that we have, but uh, as of right now, it seems like uh, Aurora Laura, the associate superintendent, is taking on the duties of a superintendent, and uh, Rob New is, uh, is still in town uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future until the board meets again. Good stuff, Ben. Don, we'll bring you in at this point. Uh, breaking news this morning, or at least new news this morning on Sandridge. Yeah, Sandridge uh, disclosed in a regulatory filing that the, the Department of Justice had notified them that they were no longer the target of an antitrust investigation. Uh, they had disclosed some time ago that they had been subpoenaed. Uh, we didn't know what all the details were, but that it just had something to do with an antitrust violation. Uh, there have been uh, the, the, the federal grand jury that uh, has been involved in this uh, issued an indictment uh, separate from Sandridge where they indicted Aubrey McClendon. Who, who then died in a car crash the next day, and those charges were dropped. Uh, now here we are a few weeks later, and Sandridge says that DOJ says they're no longer the target of this investigation. We have no idea if those two things are linked together. Uh, there's a lot of suspicion that, that, that maybe they were, but we really don't know. But that is good news for Sandridge. Uh, there, were, there was some overhang on this deal. People didn't know what was going to happen if they get tied up in this, along with all the other financial problems that they've got with the wastewater disposal problems they've got. Uh, this, this, is, uh, this is good news for them to get this kind of out of the way. Well, and a good news uh, week overall for Oklahoma energy companies. Yeah, uh, oil prices have been uh, pretty strong lately. Back in February, they went as low as $26 a barrel. Right now, we're at a little bit over 40 
uh, which is a big improvement, which is you know, still a huge uh, disparity from where we were 20 months ago when we had $100 a barrel. But uh, that's helped. Uh, there's been some optimism about maybe that we're, we're getting into a recovery mode here. Uh, we've seen that reflected in stock prices. Uh, Chesapeake this week had a big jump in their stock price because they, uh, they made a financial negotiation with their lenders basically pledging everything the company owns, all the oil and natural gas they have in the ground, their hedges, their mortgages, everything, uh, to, to retain their, uh, uh, their credit uh, limit. And, and so they've got some flexibility, and it also puts off their next uh, evaluation of how much their collateral is worth for about a year. That's a big deal for oil companies. Oil companies are a very capital-intensive process. They need lots of money to do what they do. Every well they drill is a multi-million dollar project. So uh, when banks and others lend them money twice a year, they look at their assets. They, they pledge the oil and natural gas in the ground to get these loans. Well, the prices have declined so precipitously that these lenders are kind of getting edgy. They're, they're limiting how much they can have. Through this deal where they, they made this big bet, they bought themselves a year of time. The hope is that, that oil prices will continue to recover that natural gas prices really can't get much lower. So uh, uh, that, that and, and Chesapeake stock went up 50% in a day after that. So it was a big They had a big, a big Tuesday. We saw some big prices on some of the other local energy companies as well. Oh, yeah. They, they, all, they all did really well this past week. Uh, you know, Devon, Continental, we saw a lot of, lot of uh, uh, prices uh, bouncing back. Something else we saw this week was a lot of thunder banners going up on various businesses in the downtown area, Midtown, Bricktown. Uh, businesses are getting involved in the, uh, in fact, you can see it across the street over there at the coal court in the civic uh, cheerleading, I guess. Oh, yeah, they love this. I mean, the playoffs are great. Uh, and I think it's more, even more of an event than a regular Thunder game. People tend to get there earlier and stay later. Uh, you know, you get free T-shirts. Uh, you know, sometimes the games are scheduled at odd times. You know, usually we know that Thunder tip-off is going to be at 7 o'clock unless it's a TV game. The playoffs, you get late games, you get early games. Uh, it's great for the for the companies that are downtown, and they want to, you know, hey, everybody loves a winner, you know, so they want to get in on that. Mike will bring you in at this point, a bit of a later tip off uh, game one Saturday, 8.30, right? 8.30, uh, the, the late game on the first day of the NBA playoffs. Dave, it's been since the last time the Thunder was in the playoffs, consider this, the price of oil, a barrel of oil was $109. That's quite a bit higher than it is right now. Derek Fisher, since that game, he was guarding Tim Duncan in the post, which probably is the reason why game six, May 31st, 2014, not a good did not matchup. turn out well for Oklahoma City. That was the Western Conference Finals. Derek Fisher has been hired and fired as a coach. Scott Brooks is maybe going to be the Timberwolves coach now, maybe going to be the uh, Wizards. Yeah. Uh, he was coaching the Thunder. Um, all Donald Trump. Donald Trump was in season 13 of 14 of The Apprentice. He had yet to be known as a presidential candidate. So, a lot of water under the bridge just in that short amount of time. Titanic had still sank at that point. It is I mean, still there's sunk. a lot of historical <laughs> references down. here. It was down. Um, anyway. Oklahoma City versus Dallas. Uh, yeah. Some people are saying all of the first round series in the Western Conference could be over quick. Your thoughts on that? Oh, sure. I mean, this looks like a four or five game series. The, the Mavericks had to fight to get in. They're banged up. They're the masking tape Mavericks, as Rick Carlisle calls them. But they pass the ball well, and they knock down open threes. That's a little bit of a concern for a Thunder team, especially one with a gambling point guard uh, that tends to leave some openings. But uh, Westbrook's on this historic triple-double, uh, and there should be lots of long rebounds for Westbrook uh, because of the way Mavericks shoot threes. There should be a lot of open Thunder players because they don't move around as well. Uh, so expect some triple doubles. Uh, Jenny Carlson wrote today, hey, remember this uh, Kevin Durant guy, he was pretty good in playoffs the last time he was in it. Um, he was the, That was his MVP season. He, this is his chance to announce himself again as a great player. We've kind of forgotten about that. You know, Seth, uh, Steph Curry, Golden State Warriors, uh, Tim Duncan, Old Man Riverwalk is still going. Those are the two teams that have gotten all the hot headlines. But the Thunder's Those back. Those are historically great teams. Historically though. great, yeah. One of them won 73 games, <laughs> uh, overshadowed by Kobe Bryant's 49 shots. I mean, 60. 50. 
He it does 50. 50 shots. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so the Thunder plays an outman Mavericks team, um, and it looks like the plan – uh, is to get through that series quickly. I think it's a good test run for Billy Donovan, his first year as coach. He's never coached series basketball before. You know, coaching the Florida Gators, um, the closest thing to back-to-back is uh, a game, a day between games a lot of times uh, in the NCAA tournament. So uh, a, a new deal for him, uh, but this will be a good trial run uh, that will count. And then it'll be on to the Spurs. It'll be a day between games this as well. Uh, game one on Saturday, game uh, two on Monday here in Oklahoma City, then Thursday, Saturday, I believe, down in Dallas next week. What's some of the coverage you have planned for this weekend, Mike? Well, we've got, uh, we've got all four of our folks, Barry Trammell, Jenny Carlson, uh, Eric Horn, Anthony Slater are going to be at the arena. Um, a representative group of them will be making the trip down to Dallas. We've got a package of stories going in on closing time. Um, the Thunder has had struggles in the fourth quarter. I think they lead the NBA with blown fourth quarter leads or, or way up there for a contending team. It's a little deceptive. Uh, sometimes those leads have been very slight going into the fourth quarter, but we, anybody who's watched the game can see what's happened to them. They're obviously going to have to recover and improve in that area. So Anthony Slater's break, getting in that fourth quarter uh, trend and breaking it down for us. That'll be in Saturday's editions. Barry Trammell is looking at the season that the Thunder has been planning for for years has arrived. Um, Kevin Durant's free agent year and all that's riding on these playoffs because of that. However, complicating things are things that nobody could have planned. Nobody could have planned the spike in the payrolls that's going to happen next year, which will bring everybody, all the teams in the NBA, into competition for Kevin Durant in the offseason. In the old days, before the there would have been three or four teams with salary cap room to compete for Kevin Durant, and they would have all been bad teams. Now Golden State, heck, San Antonio could enter the bidding for Kevin Durant. That's never happened before. Whenever a free agent moves, they move from a good team to a stress team, a team not so good, Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, is, a, is a great example when he went from the Magic to Do you watch that last Los night? I thought that was, was excellent, really good. didn't you? It's good stuff. That was really cool, especially for someone who's followed the Lakers. Yes. Um, anyway, so Barry's going to be looking at that. Jenny's got a column on whether it indeed is all as title or bust for Kevin Durant and whether he, uh, his, his plans to stay here. And Eric's got the big matchups page. Um, and that'll be in Saturday's editions, and people uh, have lots of time on Saturday to read that before showing up at the arena, 7 o'clock, 7.30, getting their T-shirt, getting their seats. They can also discuss face, facial hair. That We have, like, a, what, a 15, 20-minute video with Ennis Cantor and Stephen Adams, the Stash Brothers. That was kind of a cool story by Anthony Slater. If you think about that. Um, There's KD s- sitting in with uh, Slater. Here's two guys <laughs> who couldn't be more different. I mean, one guy comes from a part of the world where there's always a shrimp on the Barbie. Uh, you're, 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 That'd be Steven Adams, by the you way. You've got flip-flops. Uh, the other guy is from a part of the, the world that's war-torn and distrustful. And the guy from the war-torn place has bounced around, led a nomadic existence as, an, uh, as a basketball player. Um, his father is fairly wealthy, sent him on this uh, odyssey to, to make uh, a name for himself. The other guy lost his father, really raised by a village. And um, Stephen Adams hadn't had his payday yet. I mean, he's the starting center making a fraction of what Ennis Canner makes. Ennis Canner spent time in Utah rooting against the people on his own team so he could get more playing time. And yet Stephen Adams sort of made room on this team and in his heart and friendship for Ennis Canner. And uh, so Anthony's story really tells how that all happened. That's a really rarity in a professional locker room. You know, most of the time it's all about my minutes, my paycheck, my future, my max deal. Uh, and I think it's really a testament to the kind of person Stephen Adams is that this whole mustache, stash brothers thing surfaced. You ever grown a mustache? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Back yeah, I think, it's, I think it's possible you could go back in the 80s and find <laughs> pictures of me and Mike Ball when they, somebody called us the Stash Brothers. And the so, Oklahoma Archives is a great place to find that. <laughs> yeah. So not original, Stephen I Adams. See. Sorry. Very nice. we, we'll, I'll get us out of here on this. You were noting a headline before we started here about uh, the NBA and advertising on uniforms. And you're right, international soccer 
uh, for a long time has had perhaps over the top advertising just right across the top. Is that something we could be seeing here fairly soon? Are Thunder we'll, sporting a Loves logo or something? We'll be seeing 17-18 season. Uh, not next year, the 2017-2018 the season. The, there will be somebody's logo. I don't know, maybe News OK's, Dave. It's maybe yours. It's a good looking logo. Maybe your own it's logo. Simple. Clean. Yeah, maybe Don's Twitter handle on uh, on Kevin Durant's uh, yeah. logo. I'm, I'm going to have to get my max contract before that. <laughs> <laughs> Don, what do you have coming up this weekend? Uh, Brianna Bailey went and visited some farmers. There's some uh, state question that's going to be on the ballot uh, about that's called Freedom to Farm. Uh, some people say that's a misnomer. Other people say it's a good thing. She's going to take a look at it, talk to people who are doing the farming in Oklahoma about about what they think about this legislation. Uh, I've heard that's a little bit contentious. It is, absolutely. And we're going to try and lay it out and just tell you what it means as, as best as we can figure out. Ben, what you working on for the weekend? Yeah, we've got to actually, you know, there's been a lot of kind of negative press, uh, our, our, you know, kind of down news about schools, obviously, with budget cuts and those kind of things. Uh, Sunday, we actually have a story that takes a look at some nonprofits that are, uh, you know, kind of see their work and working with a school district as more important than ever. And uh, uh, actually kind of some ways that people who maybe might be inspired after reading that story to, to get involved and, and to donate whether their money or their time. And so a lot of good things are, are happening in the, in the school system. And I think I think we do a good job of showcasing that. But, uh, but you know, moving forward, we're going to continue to, to follow uh, what do these projected budget cuts mean? I mean, right now you've got the governor and the and the House Speaker kind of uh, at, at odds over what the cut to education will be, and there's still a lot of unknowns. The school districts are right now in the planning stages for, for next school year. All right, good stuff. Gentlemen, thanks for your time. Thanks. Much appreciated. I know Thank you, you uh, had a busy day as we put out the, the weekend editions of the newspapers. Thanks, appreciate that. Thanks, these stories and more in upcoming editions, weekend editions of the Oklahoma That Thunder Game Saturday nights, and more coverage can be found on newsok.com.